which is one of the very good things we have found out in Tamil Nadu startups where everybody who has started something is in it for the long term be it in Chennai, be it in Madurai, be it in Coimbatore, any of the other cities there is a passion for us to start something with a longer term vision One of our partners in the fund used to mentor Ether and uh, he used to tell us that look at clean tech and it's going to change this way and that's where the seed came from uh, 2013, 2014 or so and uh, today uh, we have funded two uh, ex Aether entrepreneurs who have come out of Aether, found a gap and built. Uh, as they say in Tamil, and they continue to do that. So they are extremely great in terms of products and loyalty and, and delivery and execution, but they're extremely poor, sorry to say, in terms of marketing the good work that they are doing. We have to explain it to the startups that there is a good startup and there is an investable startup. Not every startup is investable and not every invested startup is a good startup. It need not be the same thing. So let's you know get into the Tamira part of the startup Tamira, right? So uh, what is it that you have seen? And you know, when before you made your first you know investment in Tamil Nadu, if you made one or you know in terms of perspective that you had before entering the state you know and how your interactions with the startup community here has probably changed right so uh, we will start with you rohit in terms of you know uh, please talk to us about you know uh, when your in interaction with startups in tamil nadu and how it has changed you know in the flavor of the companies that you meet Sure. So um, I think our experience in Tamil Nadu, obviously, with the flavors of the day, have changed, right? So used to be edtech, used to be SaaS, used to be fintech. It has moved as the industry has moved. So uh, in terms of which industry the companies are coming up in, Tamil Nadu has followed that. But the stability or the underlying commonness in all of them is the uh, is the focus on building a large company. It's the focus on being on it for a very long term, right? It's not, um, I want to buy and I want to exit as a founder. It's like, I want to be the guy running the company for a very long time, which is one of the very good things we have found out in Tamil Nadu startups, where everybody who has started something is in it for the long term, be it in Chennai, be it in Madurai, be it in Coimbatore, any of the other cities. There is a passion for us to start something with a longer term vision. Now, how long is it might be 10 years, 20 years, how large it might be, might be India, might be Tamil Nadu, might be global, but it is always for the long term. And I, as an investor, would be very comfortable when I see that the founder is in it for the long term. I would rather back that founder as well. So uh, we have seen SaaS companies, we have seen hardware companies, we have seen deep tech companies. There is something for everybody in Tamil Nadu. Uh, and uh, what I also believe is that there is an opportunity even in sectors which are not global. So in Tamil Nadu itself, there might be gaps in the industry which could be filled up by some of these startups. And you would not know about it because these gaps are something which not everybody talks about. But these guys from the industry have started something and tried to fill up these gaps as well. We were looking at companies uh, which were doing uh, quality checks for pipes, automating that. Right now, you don't talk about it, but that is a gap big enough in the industry to fulfill as a startup itself. And many of the com companies we see in Tamil Nadu are doing a lot of work in that. So there is potential, there are gaps, small and big, uh, and there is something for everyone in Tamil Nadu is what I feel. Very nice. You know, you're saying long-term thinking is yeah. something that fits uh, Tamil Nadu. So, Prem, you talked about investing in as many as 23 states, right? And you have your roots in this state, right? So, what is it that you have seen and, uh, you know, specific to Tamil Nadu and, you know, kind of what have you seen changing as well? I would, I would rather focus on the contrary, what has not changed. Uh, what has not changed is loyalty. What has not changed is high degree of integrity. What has not changed is people being humble. On the other side of the coin, what has not changed is they are still extremely conservative, right? 
they, if, if a founder is operating with, with any of the 30 plus districts of Tamil Nadu, they continue to stay in that district or confined to that particular district for longer. I'm talking about majority of the population. Their ability to think beyond that is difficult. And I think um, part of it is the culture where in the education system in a way, I think, you know, they want to perfect everything. They always continuously keep questioning us, uh, themselves. Oh, am I perfect enough? Am I ready for the next big thing? The next big thing could be even going to the next district. So that inhibition is continuously there. And that is where, you know, despite the fact that we have grown from about 1,500 startups to about 10,000 plus startups today, in the last four or five years, the number of uh, startups from Tamil Nadu, which have actually expanded into other states of India, forget about global, yeah. is limited. The number of startups fetching capital from outside Tamil Nadu or even within Tamil Nadu also yeah. is fairly limited. Okay, because the culture is such that, uh, as they say in Tamil, mm -hmm. and they continue to do that. So they are extremely great in terms of products and loyalty and, and delivery and execution, but they're extremely poor, sorry to say, in terms of marketing the good work that they are doing, both on the local and domestic as well as international arena. That is the major inhibiting factor. We have tried to change that. Okay. At the same time, because of that, if you think about the business plans of uh, majority of the companies, it's not bold enough. Despite the fact that we knowing that they can actually be bold, right? So, and we have to go and convince them they can be bold. And, but then what happens is basically they are thinking that we don't understand their space. Right. So that's where the deals f don't flow through. So what we are expecting is look at, don't look at your, your, you don't look at your opportunity estate just within the four walls or confined to the region that you're working up, I think beyond. But whereas if you, if you do a comparison from the north, you know, even though the delivery could be low, they are bold enough to think bigger and they'll be much more salesy. Tamil Nadu is much more execution focused. Execution, execution, execution. So that, that needs to change. Okay. And we have not seen that change barring very few success stories. Okay. So, and this is not just... Um, this is not just a, a, a phenomena that we are seeing um, in tier two, tier three cities of Tamil, not even tier four, even tier one, we are being, saying the same thing. Yeah, I, I'll agree to what he says, because when we talk to companies who can at least be national level presence, right, who can make a national level presence, and they have no revenues right now, their plans are not national level. I'm not asking you to be right now generating revenues from 28 states of India. But I'm saying, do you plan to generate revenues from all the states of India? Their plans do not incorporate that vision. So when I look at the founder, we have to understand whether this founder has the capability of taking it abroad or the intention of taking it pan-India. And a lot of talks do not give us the comfort factor that somebody will do a larger business than what he is planning to do. Very nice. And no, no, good. We had the two uh, kind of diverse perspectives and also, uh, you know, come, you want to add to us? I just want to add. I think, I think being humble doesn't mean you should be lower, lowering your goals. Exactly. We are traditionally, Tamil Nadu is known for very humble. And I've seen exactly the same thing with Odisha as well. There's very, very, very similar, too many similarities with Odisha as well. Right. Very humble. But Odisha is coming out of that and becoming bolder. Right. Tamil Nadu, humble, humble, humble. That's all we have been taught to. Yeah. Uh, come, uh, uh, and, and, uh, and that is actually re reflecting on their business plans and business goals and vision. Fair enough, fair enough. So, end of the day, you know, it is like role models, right? It comes and we have seen the first SaaS startup to go public on NASDAQ is from right here. You obviously mentioned there are these exceptions. So, to a large extent, you know, climate being, you know, the next big opportunity, SaaS, in Tamil Nadu, you know, being the capital is very well known. So what from your lens, you know, can be uh, both nationally as well as, you know, from this part of the country can be some of those, you know, kind of path breaking startups like, you know, Freshworks or a Zoho was from here. Mm. What have you seen and, you know, what do you think? you know, can kind of help break this mold that he's talking about. Yep. So one of the most successful EV startup that we see, which is Aether, Absolutely. 
which was born in IIT Madras. And that actually stemmed a lot of people who had worked there, learnt, uh, built their skills to start new startups. Bunch of them we funded too. In fact, uh, one of the reasons why even I started looking at this space at one point of time is uh, because one of uh, someone, one of our partner in the fund uh, used to mentor Ather, and uh, he used to tell us that look at clean tech, and it's going to change this way. And that's where the seed came from, uh, 2013, 2014 or so. And uh, today uh, we have funded two uh, ex Aether entrepreneurs who have come out of Aether, found a gap and built. Uh, two of them. So I think uh, that shows there's a lot of promise. Uh, Aether did leave and go to Bangalore. Yes. Uh, and for the major part of the time, right? And that's where I think uh, the government can also come together and uh, they are active when it's at a much larger scale when it comes to like the whole automotive industry that you see, right? Uh, a lot of them are in Tamil Nadu, Hosur, uh, more, more precisely. Uh, I think that's an area where the government could also come step up and uh, give them everything that they need to make sure they stay. Like you rightly said, you know, it's also a perception issue, uh, you know, in terms of whether it is Aether or Ola, their biggest factories are in Tamil Nadu, just across the border, right? So, uh, Shirag, you know, coming to, uh, you know, you from the same Tamil Nadu lens, you know, back to that, you know, where also kind of put your portfolio in context, uh, you made so many investments, what percentage of them are from this, both from actually consummated deals and the deal flow that you are seeing? So we have done uh, three investments in Tamil Nadu so far and uh, right now we are uh, in an active discussion with two more investments which we are likely to close in about three to four months. Um, I want to uh, touch up upon when we talk about Tamil Nadu investments. Uh, so first of all, our focus is uh, deep tech investments. Now the that scales down the number of companies from 10,000 to approximately 500 companies in Tamil Nadu, which is the number that Tamil Nadu has as, as a whole. And 500 is the no, number, approximate number of companies in the deep tech space in Tamil Nadu. However, now within that uh, domain, there are two splits. One are one is uh, Tamilians or people from Tamil Nadu building and they are here because they have always been there. And there is the other segment of uh, uh, engineers or student entrepreneurs who came to Tamil Nadu uh, to join uh, IIT Chennai or some of the very nice universities that are here in Tamil Nadu. And they have built while they were uh, in the university and uh, that's why they are here. And now th the behaviors for two different segments is very different. My understanding of Aether, when you were talking about Aether, uh, uh, the, the founders, Tarun, I believe, I'm not sure, is not originally from Tamil Nadu. And so are a significant portion of deep tech founders right now. They are not originally from Tamil Nadu. They have made it home. The problem that, we're, uh, that Tamil Nadu uh, right now needs to solve or address is why some of them become so successful while they are here and they despite the success choose to move to a different location their headquarter like in Aether, uh, uh, they have uh, you said you, they moved to bangalore they still choose to dis, despite the initial success and traction and everything when they hit a certain stage they decide to move to a different city so that is a very different dimension to look at versus uh, people from tamil nadu building here from our perspective, we are uh, quite indifferent if it's a Tamil Nadu based entrepreneur or is it from outside coming here. Having said that, one of the things that uh, both, uh, both Prem and, uh, uh, and Rohit touched upon is the cultural aspect of it. Now, and they talked about uh, people being humble, people want to make, uh, Rohit was talking about people uh, trying to keep it profitable and long term. Uh, now there are two sides of it, which we look at. How we look at it from an investment perspective, there are two sides of it. One side of it is absolutely fantastic. There is a guy from Tamil Nadu who is building this business, 
and wants to be in this business for a long period of time. That is amazing news for any investor. But now there's a flip side of it. There's this guy who may not un uh, may, may make it a lifestyle business and and probably want to be in this business forever, which basically means that even when the company may need a professionalization to reach a national level or a global scale, he he may choose to sacrifice the nationalization or uh, uh, national level growth or a global level growth because he wants to run it like that, the way Rohit was describing. So that's a very, very a fine, nuanced conversation. Um, and I will not say there is a magic wand to figure it out on which side of the, of the puzzle the founder sits on. But this nicely ties to some of the previous conversation that we were talking about. When, when an entrepreneur is talking to any of the investors, they need to understand the motivation for the investor is as much as the investors want to build a business and be part of the business, the investors are conscious that in five years or seven years or long as possible, 10 to 12 years, they want to get the money back. And the focus is not to get the dividends on an annual basis for most of the venture capital investors. The focus is to have capital gain, which can be achieved either using a secondary exit or mergers and acquisition or buyback or an IPO. They have it, the founder has to have the acceptance of the fact from day one that when a when an institutional investor comes in, they are not there for life. We don't want to be there for 50 years or for uh, for the generations to come. We are there for 10 years or 12 years maximum. They can choose to make it a generational business, but they have to make sure that the investor gets the money back, and then they can uh, they can continue to do that. So that those nuancing when we are looking looking at it uh, uh, is looked at it very carefully, uh, and those conversations are often brought upfront. Uh, in fact, in some of our upfront negotiations as well, um, we also bring up the conversation of liquidity and exit on how exactly that can happen and what is our motivation to invest. Even I even though I may be passionate about something, I will initiate the conversation upfront on how those are possibilities and understand uh, the reactions or comfort zone uh, from, uh, from, from the entrepreneur. Something that Prem said was actually very beautiful that uh, you may not want to plant the conversation that uh, I've just started building the company and you're talking about selling the company right now and which is a very, very it is a sensitive conversation. And, but the entrepreneurs also need to realize the, just like they are the entrepreneurs we are also, uh, and they are taking money from the in, uh, any institutional investor. Uh, we, as a venture capital firm, have also taken money capital from some of the some of the investors, and and sometimes the, the chain is quite deeper. So everyone's interest has to be aligned, even if this, this is a very uncomfortable conversation. It has to happen. Great. No, I think we had. You want to add something? Yeah, I mean, you know. Um, a couple of things he touched upon is a conversation we always have with the founders. One of them is about, you know, uh, the founders coming to us and say, sir, this is what we are doing. With your fund, you tell me what to do. I will grow that way. And we always tell them, dude, you are the driver of the car, which is your startup. We are essentially passengers on it, right? You decide where the company goes. And we decide at what stop we get out and at what stop we get in. Right, so we are not in it with you till the end. We obviously have an entry criteria and an exit criteria. At early stages, we may have, you know, based on our thesis, we may have different exit criteria and entry criteria. But we are not the drivers of the company. You are the driver of the company. We will believe the vision that you have given us, and we will invest in that vision, and we will be with you till we can add value, and then probably we want to get out. Right. Another topic, what he pointed out was, we have to explain it to the startups that there is a good startup and there is an investable startup. Not every startup is investable and not every invested startup is a good startup. It need not be the same thing. We as investors 
would want to see a combination of a good investable startup. There are certain startups which are good if you run it and you make money out of it and you, you know, pay your bills out of it. But there are certain startups which are investable where external funding can come in, help you grow. And then that external funding has to go back. It would not be there for the whole time. So our criteria is to see how exactly can I merge a good with an investability and then invest them. Very nice. You know, I think uh, we can probably move uh, to something a bit more fun in the form of, you know, like we've talked about what we cover, what we like, you know, whether it is deep tech or climate tech and so on, right? So what are some of your pet peeves, right? So when a climate tech startup pitches you, you know, what gets your, you know, this thing, oh God, don't say this. So for example, I can say today AI is a word that gets bandied about and every company out there just adds an AI thinking like you rightly said, this is what the investor wants to hear, right? So where do you want to draw the line saying, I will figure this out you kind of keep your story straight. So what are some of your pet peeves? What is climate? What is not? And, you know, what is it that you look at from a deep tech that, you know, what kind of is crossing the boundary there, right? So how they want to spin it the way you would want to hear, like you said, should be avoided, right? So what are some of the pet peeves? Maybe you can think of, Ryan. Sure. Uh, I mean, like, yeah, do not say AI, ML for the sake of saying it without knowing what it is. And if there is no application, don't say it. It's okay. You can just... I think you can just keep it simple. Uh, tell us what you're doing, uh, probably in a minute. And if you're gonna take longer, then probably you yourself don't know what you're doing. And uh, you gotta go figure out and understand what you want to focus on. Know exactly what the problem you're solving and how are you solving it. It's okay to also say you don't know even if it's in your domain. It's okay, we'll figure it out together. But do not say uh, that you know about something or try to faff. Uh, obviously, the founder knows more than us because they are the founder. Uh, and uh, we go with the benefit of doubt. Obviously, we verify at the later point of time. Uh, but however, what I'm saying is, if you don't know, say don't know, it's okay. You don't have to know everything in the world. Nobody knows. Keep it straight and yeah. simple. Yeah, very nice. Very nice. Prem, anything that you want entrepreneurs to avoid? Please don't say that uh, your USP is cost. Nice. Right? I mean, today it is you, tomorrow it could be somebody else. Uh, that is number one. Uh, and number two, <clears throat> don't try and compare yourself with competition on parameters which are only based on your particular product features. That is something that's very easy for us to find out what sticks and what doesn't stick. And um, from our perspective, purely from us, if a founder has got more than one company at any where he or she is involved, it's a complete no-no. We will not invest because it's dilution of effort, dilution of mind space. Uh, mind space. So we, we don't um, uh, invest in such companies, what we invest, what we welcome is those founders who have tried and not succeeded. We, we welcome those kind of founders because that shows perseverance and gumption. Okay, we will be unlike uh, most of the things that we are seeing in India where we still think that a failure is a failure and I have to go back and do my corporate job again. No, if you're able to come back again, we support you with open arms. So please come and reach out to us. So those are the things that we would like to hear. Doesn't mean that you have to start a startup and then fail and then come to us. No, I'm not saying that. <laughs> what I'm saying is we welcome that thing. Um, and at the same time, um, um, I, there has been incidents uh, where um, the founders, uh, they started with X, Y, and Z people uh, in terms of A, B, and C people. And then one or two people have left. It's fine, but there's, some, there's someone standing, last man standing, or last woman standing. and be open with us in terms of what happened and why it happened and 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 also if there is an ongoing conflict if we like the company if you like the product and if you like your gumption in actually in real instance we actually helped one of the founders even before we invested help them navigate the conflict situation get them get the other party exit and then we subsequently invest in the company which happens to be an ai company by the way but yeah <laughs> but yes so so those are those are things that we also look out for. Um, and do not come to us with Me Too companies. There are dime a dozen Me Too companies because with Me Too, sorry, but we can't exit. So. Interesting. Chirag, yeah. So there are two, three things uh, which almost uh, upsets me. So first is uh, when people have a poor understanding of the market size. Uh, 
and just because you are into certain segment which is a part of a larger segment which may have thousand other things happening and you start talking about the market size for this is 300 billion dollars and you're trying to put an emphasis to make me feel that how or make any investor feel that how big is the market size it uh, or it, it, it's kind of a turn off um, then the second thing is about understand understanding of your competition uh, if I if, and and like Ryan said a beautiful thing that most of the time we know way less than a founder even in the companies where we have invested we will always know less than the founder very rare scenarios we will know more than the founder if a, if, a, if you're talking or having a conversation with the founder most of the time we would have read the pitch deck once or twice or may have had one or two internal discussions almost always before getting in i will do a quick google search on the keywords on what is uh, what they're doing using uh, in my head what i understand is a one line summary of what do they do if i find out some names and you have absolutely no idea what they're talking about unless their business is completely different and uh, but if i find something on page 1 of google a name of a company and you have, you can't tell me what they do and if they're related and relevant then it's a massive turn off uh, to me and, and third when they are talking about uh, a grand vision that we will build a unicorn uh, I, I feel very uncomfortable about when people start talking about the uh, the, the market valuations or the uh, that how we the road to one billion dollar market cap or uh, road to hundred million dollar valuation so there are pitch techs I've seen uh, talking about Right now, you are investing at $10 million. In the next six months, we'll be raising another round at $100 million valuation. So it's kind of a good deal for you. Okay. Uh, what they often miss out is uh, a clear articulation of wha what are the baby steps that you have you are taking, which is actually can justify to any future investor that it is actually a $100 million business now. Um, you uh, and if that clarity is not there you can't build a uh, hundred million dollar first of all you should not even come with the assumption that it's a hundred million dollar but even if you have that assumption without an articulation of baby steps it's a it's a real real turn off uh, that you are actually like he used the word you're trying to faff me so I, I think that these two three are real turn off um, I, I, before I move we move on from that uh, all of us have different types of turnoff, but that does not mean these are universal turnoff. What might be a turnoff for probably a Prem may not be a turnoff uh, for me. Uh, like he said something uh, about a founder involved in multiple companies. Uh, yes, it is a red flag, but I will not completely walk away from the conversation just because the founder is involved in a different company. Um, we have made investments uh, in a company where the founder uh, was involved in a multiple company. One of the founder was involved in multiple companies and the one of the founder was focused in that company. So uh, we made a very conscious decision in that. There are a couple of things Rohit said, a couple of things uh, Ryan said. I, I, I strongly think there is no common answer to that. Um, so, I, but being honest, about that, I think one thing that when we were talking, I was trying to figure out what is really common across all this. As long as you have honest, well researched, with a clear point of view of what you're doing, why you're doing, and how you're doing, uh, it will most of the cases will not turn off uh, any. And not trying to use fancy words like uh, Ryan said, uh, most of the time will not turn off uh, uh, any of the investors. From the investor point of view, that may become a good lifestyle business, dividend generating business. But if you are taking that route, that will almost never work with any, most of the venture capital firms. And then you should consciously make a decision that if you are taking that route, never come to venture capital firm after that. To connect with the guys who have the ideas, who are the entrepreneurs, who have taken the risk of actually starting something and stepping into the unknown. Uh, with their ideas and with our support, probably we can do something bigger. And for if I have to compare 
Tamil Nadu versus UK. <laughs> Tamil Nadu is almost the size of UK. And the number of startups there in, in the UK are far more in terms of access uh, uh, multiplication factors of what we have in. And I think uh, we have seen successful founders coming out from this land and I think this land holds promise and uh, which is why we are here and we want to see what is the next big startup that people from Tamil Nadu would build.